It seems far more stable. New chassis springs and shocks were added to the Vega to compensate for the increase in weight. However, we felt that they could have been a little stiffer. The car seemed floppy through the cone. The Pinto felt so much more solid through the pylons that we filmed this run in slow motion. Handling characteristics were a strong point in the Pinto in 73. This year, it's even better. They improved the suspension front and rear, and as you can see, stability was excellent. On the track during high-speed cornering, we noticed that body lean was quite pronounced on the Vega, and the front end had a tendency to wash out. We couldn't help but think that perhaps some of the knowledge that Ford gained in racing was reflected in the handling performance of this little car. On this new Pinto, they went to larger rubber bushings on the inboard side of the upper and lower control arms, softer bushings on the top and bottom of the shock, with two-inch longer springs. These changes made for a smoother, quieter ride. The Vega was softer and the overall ride factor was more comfortable, but in high-speed cornering, it had a tendency to wallow. The Pinto, on the other hand, felt extremely solid through the corners and took all that the engine had to offer. For the ultimate test of suspension systems, we ran both cars through the reverse spin. This run with the Pinto was done in slow motion. Even with the slack out of the suspension, body lean was not excessive. Here's the Vega. We found the Pinto to be tops in acceleration, passing ability, and overall handling. The Vega had more interior room and a softer, more comfortable ride, and was perhaps a little more quiet. These two cars will stage a head-to-head -head fight this year for sales leadership. However, they'll both have plenty of competition from the imports. models of the Camaro go to the marketplace for 1974, the economical sport coupe, and our tester, the luxurious type LT. The Z28 option is also available. Our car featured the standard V8 engine with 350 cubic inches and a two-barrel car, delivering 145 horsepower. It replaces the 307 cubic incher used in previous models. All the iron still rides on a 108-inch wheelbase. This LT version is designed to appeal to those who lean toward the European GT road machines. Suddenly it was punch the pedal time, and our 30 mile an hour run took 3.9 seconds. It lacked the fire of its 1970 predecessors, but it sure was comfortable. Seven and a half seconds off the line, we had 50. Chevy's posh little pony car did well on the way to 70. It took 12.4 seconds. We ET'd the quarter mile in 16.7 at a speed of 82 miles per hour. For stoppers, the Camaro sports power-assisted discs up front with drums in the rear. California cars feature manual brakes with this 350 cubic incher in a four-barrel car plus single exhaust. This stop from 30 took 35 and a half feet. We made several stops all the way around the track to heat the brakes. When the car came into the chute for this 50 mile an hour stop, they were hot and she shut down in 101 feet. A little correction in steering was necessary on our last stop to keep it in a straight line. However, on this 70 mile an hour panic stop, our driver couldn't hold it straight, and the car ate up 201 feet before coming to a halt.
During the pylon runs, our driver made one statement. The Z28, it ain't. It was loose. Body lean seemed to be excessive. The front end wanted to wash out. Recovery was only fair. In the front, they employed coil springs and a control arm. In the back, more coil springs and a live axle. The same handling characteristics, or lack of them, that were prevalent through the pylons were also apparent on the track. For this reason, any high degree of speed through the corners was not practical. We found this car to be a little akin to last year's XR7 Cougar, both plush, comfortable, and very soft. We made several fuel consumption tests on our Camaro and found that 60, during expressway driving, burned gasoline at the rate of about 17.4 miles per gallon. At 70, fuel consumption went down to 14.7 miles per gallon. Our overall mileage, which included all types of driving, was about 15 miles on a gallon. Chevrolet seems to be famous for building cars with a little something for everyone. We found, however, that this LT model may exclude the performance driver. It seems that this year, even American Motors is proud of their product. They no longer say, what's a matador? Instead, they tell us, this is a matador. Dick Teague is the man responsible for styling at AMC, and he deserves all the accolades for a job well done. Without having the development budget of the big three, they wisely selected parts already available from the other manufacturers, like a GM collapsible steering column, a Ford Motorcraft carburetor, plus a Chrysler Torque Flight automatic transmission. The amazing thing is that all the parts work well together. 30 miles an hour happened three and a half seconds after we left the line. Our Matador X had the top of the line 401 cubic inch V8 with a four barrel carb, and 50 miles an hour took 6.1 seconds. On the way to 60, the Torque Flight transmission was smooth, but the engine was noisy. The run lasted 11.6 seconds. We ET'd the quarter mile in 16.57 seconds at a speed of 89 miles per hour. The best thing this Matador had going for it through the pylon course was the easy to grip padded steering wheel. About 60% of the overall weight rides up front. And this became clearly evident when you start pushing it through the cones with a great deal of tire scrubbing and understeer. Per usual, we found some hesitation in the GM power steering unit when quickly going from a hard right to a hard left crank of the wheel. The engineers explained this as an inability of the power unit to keep up with the steering wheel in fast counter movements. Our tester had the heavy duty suspension, yet body lean seemed excessive and recovery slow. The Matador features 10.9-inch power-assisted disc brakes up front with 8.5 by 2.5-inch drums in the rear. The stop from 30 took only 29 feet. Stopping distances were short and good. However, erratic locking of the rear wheels made straight line stopping very difficult. This one from 50 took 96 feet. On this last stop from 70, the brakes were extremely hot. Pedal fade was excessive, as was nose dive. And no amount of correction could keep it from going squirrely. The halt happened after 189 feet. The car was quite agile on the highway, however, it didn't portray these characteristics on the track. 
In high speed cornering, the front end showed a decided tendency to wash out. The body leaned heavily in the corners, which was probably due to an abnormal amount of suspension travel. The unit body frame construction is undoubtedly the weakest point. It seems to trap all kinds of bumps, rattles, and noises in general. More insulation and a better chassis tuning would be a big help. And it's thirsty. In the time that we had the car, our overall fuel consumption measured out at 11.3 miles per gallon. For my money, the biggest improvement in this year's Matador came in the styling department. And you can't help but wonder how much of this came as a result of Roger Penske and NASCAR racing. The body is far more suitable from an aerodynamic standpoint than last year's flying brick. But it still lacks many refinements of its intermediate counterparts, like the Cutlass, Charger, Monte Carlo, etc. And then, too, you can't help but wonder why. In an era of shortages, of which fuel heads the list, that so much emphasis was placed on styling, and so little on economy. The nameplate said Mercury Cougar. That's why we knew it wasn't a T-Bird or a Montego. Whatever happened to the posh, jazzy little pony car? Well, it obviously fell into the Ford calorie tank and fattened up, like so many entries from the Ford stable. This fat cat now sits on a wheelbase of 114 inches. And there's enough light back here to keep the bulb manufacturers in business for another five years. Leather, glove sock vinyl, wood trim, and a whole mess of instruments make up one of the plushest interiors of any personal luxury type car on the market for the money. The action starts up front with this 460 cubic inch V8 fed through a four barrel carburetor and topped off with a load of emission controls. With all that muscle up front, we expected more in the acceleration runs than it gave us. 30 happened 3.5 seconds after we left the line. mile an hour run took exactly seven seconds. On our third run, the emission controls let us reach 70 miles an hour in a little over 14 seconds. The cat et the quarter mile in 18.20. We ran the first passing test from 30 to 50. It took 7.2 seconds. Going from 50 to 70, ate up 9.5. Power-assisted front disc brakes are standard on the Cougar this year, and they do help. We stopped from 30 in 38 feet. At 50 miles an hour, strange things started to happen. The pedal began a noticeable fade. Correction was necessary in steering to keep it in a straight line, and it took 109 feet to stop. We had the brakes hot for this 70 mile an hour stop, no amount of correction would keep it from pulling to the right. We thought the nose would dive right into the asphalt. 209 feet brought it to a halt with smoke and binders. Lincoln Mercury made a departure from the unitized body for this new Cougar. They now employ a body and frame construction. The body is designed to be relatively rigid, while the torque box frame is semi-flexible. We noticed this flexing through the pylon course. We also noticed excessive body lean, with rebound and recovery very sluggish. If it only handled as good as it looked. As I watched it on the track, I found it hard to believe that somewhere back around 1967, Dan Gurney drove a Cougar in the Trans Am series. The front suspension features a coil spring on the single lower control arm. The new four-link rear suspension has coil springs, two upper as well as two lower control arms with angle-mounted shocks on each side. When they fed these spring rates through the computer, somebody must have pushed the button labeled Jelly because they're soft. And our tester had the supposed heavy-duty package. I'd hate to drive the one they call standard. Why the engineers build the personal luxury type car so soft and wallowy is beyond my understanding, especially when stiffer springs, beefier sway bars, and man-sized heavy-duty shocks make for a far safer automobile and one that's a pleasure to drive. With its vinyl Landau roof, long hood, short deck profile, and an interior like Cleopatra's chamber. 
The Cougar XR7 is two tons of pure luxury. However, on this stretched cat, we found the beauty to be only skin deep. Now, if they were to mount all this glitter atop some of the knowledge they gained from the Wood Brothers on the NASCAR trail, LM would undoubtedly have the car of the century. Oldsmobile have excelled in the intermediate department for several years now. And you might be happy to learn that the 74 line is perhaps as good as any previous offering. Now, to match the Cougar XR7, we chose the Salon model from Olds. It represents the top of the Cutlass totem pole. Now, if a mid-sized car is your preference, plus scads of luxury, then decision time between these two could be quite a chore. You've seen the Cougar. Now, here's the Cutlass. On the first shot off the line, we had 30 in 3.7 seconds. The car had a 273 rear end with 350 cubic incher up front, and the ride to 50 was a little disappointing. It took about 8.5 seconds. If you get bored on the way to 50, you may fall asleep coaxing it to 60. This run took 15.6 seconds. We ran the quarter mile in 19 seconds flat at 78 miles an hour. On the Salon model, disc brakes up front are standard. From 30, it came to a halt in 34 feet. With hot brakes, this stop from 50 ate up 96 feet, with pedal fade now becoming quite noticeable. The binders on our test car were pulling severely to the right. No amount of correction would keep it in a straight line. From 70 miles an hour, this stop took 198 feet, with the pedal fading nearly to the floor. We ordered our Cutlass from the factory with the optional heavy-duty suspension system. For the few additional dollars, I consider it the best accessory buy on the market. It made this run through the pylons a piece of cake. Olds did it again. The bucket seats in this salon are superb. Just the right amount of firmness to provide excellent comfort and also good lateral support. Body lean was not excessive and the car recovered through the cones in good shape. This Cutlass took to high-speed cornering on the track as well as previous models. The big difference is the lack of power that the earlier models provided. This, of course, is due to the emission controls. There was not enough muscle to power it through any of the turns. Consequently, entry into the corners had to be made at a slower speed. Some buyers I've spoken with are hesitant about ordering the heavy-duty suspension package for fear that the ride will be too rough. And this is true with some makes of cars, but not so with the old Cutlass. Their compromise between comfortable ride and good handling is excellent, and they have the secret. Underneath the salon, we had coil springs up front with a new larger stabilizer bar and beefy shocks. In the rear, they featured four link coil springs, another stabilizer bar, plus angled heavy-duty shocks. And the whole package rides on the standard offering of 15-inch steel-belted radial tires mounted on 7-inch wide wheels. The tires added greatly to the car's cornering ability. Oldsmobile has been a leader in the intermediate field for several years. If you can overlook some of the performance deficits caused by the EPA standards, you won't be disappointed in their newest production. Neither car is noteworthy as far as fuel consumption. They both averaged about 12 miles per gallon. They carried all the accessories that you could load on an automobile. Both were very luxurious. Both had a whale of a price tag. We gave the nod to the Cutlass in the braking department, the Cougar in acceleration, the Cutlass for handling and suspension, and rated them even up for ride factor. The overall edge, well, we gave it to the Cutlass, but only by a hubcap.
increased popularity of the mini car, we figured it wouldn't take long for some manufacturer to introduce a mini trailer. And we found one. It comes from the trailer state of Indiana. And it features a fifth wheel type of hitch that allows you mobility that you wouldn't believe. With this trailer, a compact owner can now join the camper-crowded highways on a weekend trek to some not-too-distant Shangri-La. The trailer hitches to a reinforced point about midway on the roof of the car. This makes the coupling more secure, thus eliminating sway, floating, and jackknifing. The trailer itself is very light, and this hitch assembly distributes the weight evenly over all four wheels of the car. The unit contains a full bath, kitchen sink, range, closet space, and according to the manufacturer, enough sleeping room for four adults, or two adults and three children. However, we suggest that the occupants be friendly. Of course, after spending several hours en route in this car, they'll either be good friends or bitter enemies. We've heard of maneuverability, but 360 degrees? If Dad performs a few of these gyrations while the family is having breakfast, there could be a trailer load of trouble. The trailer is built especially for small domestic and imported cars, and closely matched with the wheel track width to make for easier running in modern snow. It does have some degree of aerodynamic styling, which is designed to reduce drag and give better mileage. Our tests with the Beetle providing the power averaged between 18 and 20 miles per gallon. Some call it just another little car gimmick, but good, bad, or indifferent, it does give the mini car passengers some place to go to stretch their legs. Well, that's one way to go, but uh, don't take too many and make sure they're friendly, because it do get mighty crowded. Right now it's quitting time, we have to leave you, but we'll be back with some wild racing action next week at the same time, so pull in, won't you? Until then, this is Bud Lindemann, reminding you to drive carefully, show a little courtesy, and you'll have a much happier trip. Bye-bye. Someone just to climb into an AMX, probably because it's more than just another supercar. It kind of represents a whole new way of life, not just for the owner, but the company that builds it as well. You see, in the past year, American Motors has thrown itself lock, stock, and differential into the world of racing and performance cars. And they've done surprisingly well. When they first introduced this car at Daytona Speedway, we wondered just how far their company policy would bend in this direction. Well, happily, we can say they've gone all the way. And with this little swinger, plus the javelin, it looks like blue sky for American. In an era when the jet set dominates the highway scene and supercars are the popular mode of transportation for the in crowd, American Motors has pounded out a one-way ticket to Jollyland with the AMX. Undoubtedly, some swingers must have crept into the upper echelon of AMC because until a couple of years ago, the red bricks on Plymouth Road echoed only of economy cars, compacts, and trite little cliches like the only race we want to win is the human race. And now it's socket to me time with two backbone twisters in a row, the Javelin and the AMX. And with them, they brought a tidal wave of enthusiasm to the main office, happiness to the dealers, customers in the showroom, and cars on the road. From the taillights to the grill, the car has a clean, honest look. And in the time that we had it, it drew more oohs and ahs than a Playboy bunny on Saturday night. Part of the great handling capabilities were due to these Goodyear wide oval E70 14 tires mounted on a pretty jazzy set of spokes. Our tester came from Dick Teague in the styling department and was a prototype. This is the eight-fisted V that breathed fire into the Amex with 390 cubic inches of wallop and 315 horses at 4,600 RPMs. That's not bad for openers. But our little missile had the special optional headers, 
a compression ratio of 10.2 to 1, 425 foot-pounds of torque, and on top of all this, a four-barrel atomizer. This made it a real asphalt eater. When we warmed up all eight holes and left the line, we had 30 miles an hour in 2.7 seconds. We didn't have to coax it off the line. That zinger under the hood handled our little 3,000-pound bomb with no trouble at all. We nailed 45 and 4.1. By this time, those wide ovals were hot. We pushed a pretty good 0 to 60 run in 6.3 seconds. Our best quarter mile run for the day was 14.5 with quite a bit of wheel spin. Now watch this little sweetheart snake through the pylons. Handling is the name of the game for this AMX. Our driver was able to run through the cones at 50 miles an hour and stated that she felt strong and solid all the way. Rebound and recovery, as you can see, were excellent. This 97-inch wheelbase